Solomon structures his kingdom well. I mean, it is well structured and written about. We'll talk about that today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembrick. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television. Again, this is a program from Genesis to Revelation. We are studying the Bible. It is exciting and we're having a good time. Corey's here to help us. Corey, what's up? I'm gonna be focusing in on the accomplishments of King Solomon today. All right, very good. And you have something that you put yes, together. Yes, get your March Bible guide ready. Turn to page 30. We're going to deal with a question from the Bible study on that page. All right, very good. And Ryan is here again with his scientist friend. Ryan? Well, you know, there's been a lot of skepticism surrounding the Genesis flood, even by some Christians. So today, Dr. Jonathan Sarthi is here to discuss this biblical account. All right, and as we talk about Solomon's kingdom and the structure of his kingdom, it's very important that we hear God as he speaks to us. Not just listen, but hear what he says. Get ready. As we read and study through the life of King Solomon, you're going to be reading a, a ton about his accomplishments, about things that he liked to do, about things that he did do. So today you and I are going to be putting together a little bit of a Bible biography on King Solomon and trying to get it all into one place. It's going to be easy to forget as you're going through. There's quite a lengthy uh, portion of the scripture that talks about Solomon. King Solomon was the third king of ancient Israel, and he was the last king to rule over a united Israel. Although Solomon's reign is often remembered as prosperous and extremely successful, it began contested. First Kings chapter 1 reveals how his half-brother Adonijah had verbally claimed the throne while David was still alive. Unchecked by his father, Adonijah was successful in gathering a large number of important supporters. Solomon owes his throne to his mother Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan, who interceded on his behalf to David. A public coronation was held, and David's official endorsement sealed the deal for Solomon. Standing on the peace that his warrior father, King David, had won for the nation, Solomon was tasked by David to build the Temple of Jerusalem, a task that he completed in seven years with the help of taxed labor from the people of Israel. Solomon continued his building projects, from his vast palace complex to his mass rebuilding of cities. Fortified cities complete with walls, gates, and bars, storage cities and chariot cities, his fleet of trade and transport ships, and even his later apostasy, building idolatrous high places for his various foreign wives. Solomon is also remembered as one of the wealthiest kings of Israel. His savvy in trade and business paid off for the nation, or so it would seem. The biblical authors of Kings and Chronicles are direct in pointing out Solomon's flaws. For all of his wisdom, Solomon was not a faithful man. Like his father before him, he sacrificed God's law of having one wife on the altar of political gain, marrying foreign royal women, no doubt, to seal treaties and trade agreements. Solomon seemed to have it all going for him. The son of King David, the line of Messiah, given wisdom by God to rule Israel. And yet still, he did not always act on that wisdom. His decision to build for the foreign gods of his wives was a decision that separated him from God and separated the kingdom from his sons. All of the accomplishments that King Solomon was able to do really relate back to the fact that King David created an atmosphere of peace for Israel. He was able to, you know, push back the borders of Israel to take back land that the that different enemies had uh, taken from from the Israelites, and he was able to secure that. So this time period of peace ushered in by David then gave Solomon the opportunity to become this builder king, this teacher king, you know, the king who is credited with having uh, the most booming economy in ancient Israel that there ever was. And really this is because of the foundation, uh, you know, of peace that David was able to usher in. And, and it's, it's a little bit uh, sad because, you know, peace in 
in, and unfortunately, this historic way was brought in by so much war and by so much, you know, violence. David was facing wars at the at the end of Saul's life. He inherited so many wars that he had to push back and and. Thankfully, he was successful, thankfully for Solomon, because Solomon really was able to explore all of these different avenues. We read in the Bible about so many of his building accomplishments, but also his intellectual accomplishments, and that's quite unique for a king of Israel. There's a few kings later on in time, for example, Uzziah and Hezekiah, who also are interested in these intellectual things, but by and large, Solomon was the king. Many see the Bible as simply an allegory or a collection of religious writings, but the Bible is much, much more. It is our history, that of Israel and God's work in this world. God speaks through his word and we must read it. Now today we study the truth about Solomon's kingdom. David's son Solomon was the third king of the nation. His was one of the most promoted and stable governments of the time. In fact, Solomon was said to be the wisest man who ever lived. God gave Solomon wisdom so that we can see the truth of power of God's intellect. Today, we have witnessed and continue to see the failure and the fall of many politicians. Failure happens, but not by choice. It is because they are foolish. Not all at the beginning, but at the end of his life, Solomon was foolish. First Kings chapter 4 verses 1 through 19. So King Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were his officials, Azariah the son of Zadok the priest, Elihoreth and Ahijah the sons of Shisha, scribes, Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, the recorder, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army, Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers, Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest and the king's friend, Ahishar, over the household, and Adoriam, the son of Abda, over the labor force. And Solomon had twelve governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provision for one month of the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the mountains of Ephraim, Ben-Decker in Mekaz, Shaalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth Hanan. Ben-Hesed in Arubath, to him belonged Sokoth and all the land of Hefer. Ben Abinadab in all the regions of Dor, he had Tafath, the daughter of Solomon, as wife. Beanna, the son of Ahilud, in Teanach, Megiddo, and all Beth Shean, which is beside Sheratan below Jezreel, from Beth Shean to Abel Maholath, as far as the other side of Jachneum. Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead. To him belonged the towns of Jair, the son of Manasseh in Gilead. To him also belonged the region of Argob in Bashan, sixty large cities with walls and bronze gate bars, Ahinadab, the son of Ido in Mahanaim, Ahimaaz in Naphtali. He also took Basimath, the daughter of Solomon, as wife, Beanna, the son of Hushai in Asher, and Aloth. Jehoshaphat, the son of Purua in Issachar, Shimei, the son of Elah in Benjamin, Geber, the son of Uri in the land of Gilead, in the country of Sion, king of the Amorites, and of Og, king of Bashan. He was the only governor who was in the land. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 19.
You know, Solomon takes over the kingdom. This is amazing. And he assigns himself people, people to write, people to be priests, people to take over. And really, he overcomes the kingdom. And Solomon's kingship is established with wisdom and knowledge. God gives him wisdom so he can do this. There is a weakness in Solomon. It, it is in the women. He is married to Pharaoh's daughter. That's a problem and becomes a bigger problem later on. But nevertheless, let's stay with Solomon's kingdom being wise. This is a good day to read your Bible. Get your Bible out and your Bible guide. Turn to today's passage. Very important. If you don't have yours, use the addresses at the bottom of the screen and uh, make sure that when you write to us and ask for your Bible guide that you give us an offering in any amount, that would be great. And remember, www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. And when you write to us, make sure that uh, if you can give us an offering in some amount, we would appreciate it. Pray about it. Ask what God would have you do. As we look at the ways of truth, I, I, I realize that we need to think this through. Because a structured kingdom is not something that we just put together with our business sense. A structured kingdom is not something you put together with your human ideas. A good structured kingdom comes from the wisdom, and there is a spiritual element to that wisdom. It comes from that spiritual side, and we need to think that through. We read 1 Kings chapter 4 to 7. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 19. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would help us today as we read this scripture and get some of these names uh, worked through, Father. Help us to learn and understand what you're doing because we need to hear that today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. All right, 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This is an interesting uh, read, and uh, we're going to try our best with some of these names. So King Solomon was king over all Israel. He was king over all Israel. These were his officials, Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest. The priest is the first one mentioned. Interesting. Elahoreb and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, scribes. Scribes, interesting. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahelab, the recorder. Fascinating. Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army. That comes later. Look at that. And Zadok and Abathar, the priest. Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers. And Zabad, the son of Nathan, a priest and of the king's friends. Isn't that interesting? The son of Nathan. Nathan was an important man. Abishar over the household, and Adoram, the son of Aboda, over the labor force. That's fascinating. See, Solomon, the highest priest, Solomon listed the highest priest and scribes first. They were listed first as the most important. History is not written by men, but by God. History is not written by men, but God by God. Man tries to rewrite history, but anyway, we must pay attention to the Bible. And, and again, I say man tries to rewrite history. I was the other day on the internet and looked up something on Wikipedia and I found out they were talking about the Statue of Liberty and they said the Statue of Liberty is made, of course, of tin. Tin. Yeah. No, it's made of copper. Isn't that interesting that the internet says that? fascinating. Men try to rewrite history, but history is what history is, and the Bible tells us the truth. That's why it's called the Word of God. Very important. We go back to the scripture. 1 Kings 4, 7 to 13, and Solomon had 12 governors over all of Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provision for one month of the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the mountains of Ephraim, ben Decker. In Mekaz, Shalbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elon Beth, Hannah, or Hanan, Ben Hesed in Araboth. To him belong Sokal and all the land of Hefer, Ben Abinadab in all the regions of Dor. He had Tafath, the daughter of Solomon's wife. Interesting. And Benaiah, uh, the son of Ahilo. And Tanakh, Migo, Migado, 
and all Beth Shen, which beside Zeratan, below Jezreel, from Beth Shen to Abel Mehela. As far as the other side of Jachneum, Ben Geber in Ramoth Gilead. To him belong the towns of Jair, the son of Manasseh in Gilead. To him also belong the region of Ergob in Bashan. Sixty large cities with walls and bronze gate bars. Walls and bronze gate bar. Very interesting. There were 12 governors who provided food for the king and his household. Now look at, this is important. Work for God is always necessary, challenging for us today. It's always a necessary challenge for us today. Work for God is always necessary. And we need to understand that, you know, we don't come to Christ and then sit back and relax and take it easy. No, we have to work. We have to understand that. So we get ready. Now we go back to the scripture, 1 Kings 14, uh, 4, 14 and 19. Ahinadab, the son of Iddo, Mahayanam, and Ahizmaz in Nephtali, he also took Basemath, the daughter of Solomon, his wife, and Benaiah, the son of Hushiah, in Asher and Aloth, Jehoshaphat, the son of Peru, in Issachar, and Shimea, the son of Elah, in Benjamin, Geber, the son of Uri, in the land of Gilead, in the country of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and of Og, the king of Bashan, he was the only governor who was in the land. Again, we come back to this last thought. Solomon commissioned everyone to become involved. Everyone. Today, we are commissioned to be involved in the church. A lot of people say, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay home and watch it on the internet. And then they end up staying home this week and next week and the week after and the week after and after after. And you don't go to church. Well, there is no substitute for meeting someone. There is no substitute for shaking his hand. There's no substitute for hugging them. There's no substitute for talking with them without electronics. Very important. We need to know this. We need to understand that, that the electronics are just, you know, supportive stuff. But when we talk to somebody face to face and we see somebody, then we understand them. Father, I pray today that we would hear this, especially today. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as we understand what it means to go to church, that we would, we would look for a good church, and we would look for a church that teaches the Bible, the Word of God, the whole Bible, and that you would provide in every city, in America, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand, in the UK, in South Africa, a church that we can go to. of Sheba, she's heard about Solomon, and she's coming down to check him out because she's not sure that he really has the wisdom that he claims or that they claim about him. Let's talk about it and discover what she discovers about King Solomon next time on Quick Study Television. Right now, here's Ryan. Well, you know, one of the most attacked portions of the Bible is the account of the Noahic Flood. In fact, even some Christians totally or partially deny this historical account. Now, why is that? Well, I'm joined by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, who's here to explain one of the possible motivations for that rejection. He also gives some scientific evidence that the flood did indeed occur, and that it was global in nature. Now, the Genesis flood is one of the most attacked portions of the Bible. Oh, yes. 
Now, is there any evidence for this account? Uh, and first, let's work out why it's attacked, because um, in science, you can always trade intensity for time. So if you have an intense process, you no longer need the millions of years assumed to lay down all the rocks and the fossils. So the flood was one of the first things to be attacked, even before Darwin's time. The attack came on rejecting a flood out of, by decree because we're not seeing floods, global floods happening now, so it couldn't have happened in the past, they reckon, you see. So um, instead of the flood, they have slow and gradual processes. Now, there are certain categories of evidence, and one is the rapid formation of the rock layers, and you can tell they're rapidly formed because of the fossils they're in. I mean, have you ever seen fossilized roadkill? You see, uh, to, to get a fossil, you have to bury it quickly and bury it quite deeply. Otherwise, a thing would, would bloat, would decay and float and escape the burial. So it has to be buried quite deeply. So you're talking about very rapid formation of layers. But the other aspect is very little time between the layers because we see certain markings that like raindrop marks, I mean, footprints. I mean, how long would your footprint lasts if you left it outside. Not very long, right? Uh, so when you have footprints there, it means the next layer must have buried and cemented those features almost immediately. So incredibly rapid formation of individual layers, but also very little time gap between them. Those are key evidence. And then you've got the runoff of the flood, uh, and that's when you get things like the planation surface, like a giant plane has gone over the landscape, planed it flat, and then you've got these enormous uh, valleys much bigger than the rivers they're in, that are in them now. And sometimes valleys which are up in the mountain, there's nothing, there's nothing to carve from now, you see. So uh, water was once above the mountains to carve those water gaps and wind gaps. Isn't that interesting? One of the reasons the Genesis flood is rejected is because if a global flood did indeed occur, then the geologic layers were laid down very quickly not over millions of years, as the evolutionists say. This, of course, completely destroys the idea of deep time and an old Earth. Hence, those committed to millions and billions of years will naturally need to reject the global flood. However, as Dr. Sarfati also pointed out, there is scientific evidence that the flood did happen. In his commentary of Genesis 1 through 11, called the Genesis Account, Dr. Sarfati goes into great detail about the flood and the scientific evidence for it. Now, to get your copy, please contact Creation Ministries International. I think it's interesting as you look at the geological record, a lot of people see long periods of time, but other scientists, like creation scientists, they don't see long periods of time. They see shorter periods of time, and it's laid down quick. Right. That is fascinating. And this is one of the problems when you're, when you're a Christian and you want to believe in deep time, uh, right? Because then you have to start saying, okay, then how did the geologic column come about? Yeah. You know, then you have to start rejecting parts of the flood, you either totally reject it or you partially reject it, saying, you know, well, maybe it was just local. But the Bible's clear. It was a global flood. It's true. I mean, so, it was over every mountain on the earth. Yeah. Biblical and, authority has to come first. Well, that's true. If biblical authority is, is fact. And, yeah. you know, if you're going to argue over a global flood, you gotta, you're arguing with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So anyway, very good, Ryan. Thank you so much for bringing him to us. What did we do this month for our study? Our quick study offer this month is called Quick Study Unplugged Spiritual Experiences. It is a discussion DVD with the cast of Quick Study where we talk about spiritual experiences that we see in the Bible, spiritual things, and also spiritual experiences that people have or claim to have. Uh, and we discuss all of these things. Are they true? Are they false? Where do we stand? Uh, so if you would like to get a hold of your copy of Spiritual Experiences, get a hold of us. It's for a suggestion a donation of $20 or more. Very good, excellent, and mm -hmm. what did you do today? Well, with our guide this year, something new that you have added to it is a Bible study after every seven days of reading. So we are gonna focus in on page 30 of the March guide, which is our weekly Bible study from 2 Samuel 4 through to 1 Kings 3. And I'm gonna take a look at the discussion question number one. It makes a couple of statements here. God chooses who will take over. God chose you to lead in your friendships. And here's the question. Are you doing so? Leading in your friendships. Yes. Now, what did you mean by God chooses who will take over? Do you want to clarify that? Just to say that God is in charge of everything and God knows how we're going to choose. So mm -hmm. He understands the future and he gets it. And he decides if we have a bad government or a government that is 
uh, loose or whatever, he knows that and he prepares us for that. And at the same time, if we have a good government, he knows that and we are prepared for that. So God chooses who will lead in uh, the uh, government and also in our society. God chose his people to lead in their friendships and in their workplaces. So the question is, are we leading? Do we have uh, a moral leadership? Because we don't have any moral leadership anymore in today's world, so it seems. Mm -hmm. So you have to, it comes down to the people. You can't apply a law and expect that law to fix things. It comes back to the people. The people have to make a decision. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to live like that. Not because the law says so, but or the law doesn't say so, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But I have to do that because I love the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the question is, are you doing that? So I would, I would want to define as well what you mean by lead, leading, mm -hmm. because I think that there could be a couple of different ideas uh, from, a, from a world standpoint yes. and, and from a biblical standpoint or from a spiritual standpoint mm -hmm. of what you, what you would define leader as being. Yeah, because on, on the one, th one hand, someone could say, well, I, I lead by telling everyone what to do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a type of leader, but is it a biblical leader? Is it a godly leader? Well, the question is there, and, and this is the discussion that uh, comes after this, is that the Bible itself uh, has in leadership. When you talk about leadership, you're speaking about morality, you're speaking about lifestyle leadership, you're speaking about talking with God, mm -hmm. and you're speaking about all these things. Mm -hmm. And today we hear that, uh, you know, you got to leave the personal life of the politicians out. But my point is, wait a minute, everybody's a leader. They have to lead somewhere, some direction. Mm -hmm. God calls us to lead. Mm -hmm. So it's an expansion of leadership. It's not a, a leadership like this person leads because they have that. That's not what it is. This is, are you leading? Are mm -hmm. you listening to God, somebody higher than anybody else, God? Mm -hmm. Higher than the government, higher than the military, mm -hmm. higher than anything. Are you listening to what he says to you? And do you do it? Do you live your life according to how God desires us to live our life? Are we working in that direction? Right. Mm. So are we choosing to try to cultivate our morality and cultivate um, the fruits of the spirit that, that God will give us according to Galatians 5? That's absolutely mm -hmm. true. Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, and faith. Mm -hmm. Gentleness, kindness, and faith. Then the, the last two are very important. Meekness... Mm -hmm. and temperance. Mm -hmm. Meekness is a fascinating word. We don't have time, but it would be great to study that and look at the word meekness. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And temperance, self-control. So yeah, we need, to, we need to listen to what God tells us. This is fruit of the Spirit, mm -hmm. not gifts of the Spirit, not doing magical things that people see. But this is what is in your life. It's something that you have cultivated and you've said, God, I need to develop this, the fruit of the Spirit, capital S. And that's important because you have to have the Holy Spirit in order for you to be able to do that. So that's what we're talking about.